I was raised with the idea that research was this ever-growing pile of knowledge where everybody was building on the work of their predecessors. But as I was doing my PhD, I found out that everyday research practice can also feel like reinventing the wheel. And I think we can do better than that. Hello everyone, welcome to this video in which I will talk about open science and why I think sharing code is the single best thing we can do to improve the quality of science. My name is Peter Kavla. I'm from the Netherlands, I studied meteorology in Wageningen University, and that's also where I did my PhD. And during that time I realized that there's a lot to learn, not just about the atmosphere, but also about the way in which we do research. And that's why after my PhD I moved to the eScience Center, because I wanted to learn all kinds of best practices that exist in research software development. And I'm really happy that today the EMS is organizing a seminar on open science, that I get the opportunity to share some of the lessons I learned with you. So let's get started. Over the past few years, we've already seen a lot of good development in the context of open science. For example, open access publishing or the FAIR principles for research data management. But when you think about sharing code, that is really lacking behind. The main mode of communication in academia is still to peer reviewed journal publications. But it's really hard to reproduce a complex data analysis from just the description in the paper. And then if you want to publish a paper, you have to go through this lengthy and thorough review process, but nobody ever looks at your code. And I think that's kind of weird, because that's what I spend most of my time on. Code is what produces all of those results that are published in those papers. And to think that that is not really checked or not really shared, is actually a bit scary, right? There was this one time where I got an email from some random guy asking me like, Hey Peter, uh, I read your paper, it was very interesting. Uh, I'm doing something similar, also related to low-level jets. And I was hoping I could use your code, could you please send it to me? And I was like, yeah, sure. Well, wait, let's see. Then I'd have to... And then I ended up sending him a completely modified version of my code, where I polish everything made it especially for him, spent quite a bit of time on that. And as I was sending the code, I had written an email and I was hovering with my mouse over this send button. It felt like publishing my diary. So I hope you all agree that it's a good idea to start sharing code, but now I wanna talk about where to start. And for me, where to start is really about the quality of the code. Because in the beginning, I was really hesitant about sharing my code because I felt maybe the quality was not good or it contained bugs or whatever. And then I discovered that there are tools to automatically check this for you. Those are called linters. But to show you how that works, I dug up some old codes uh, what, that I wrote during my PhD to analyze some IFS data. And if you scroll to this code, you can see that there's a couple of very long lines, 161, 162. Here I'm using Flake 8 to automatically check for uh, code quality uh, issues. And you can see indeed that it highlights these uh, lines as being too long. Now I'm running AutoPep 8, which is an automatic formatter. And as you can see, it changed the uh, spacing of those lines. And if I run Flake 8 again to check whether the errors are gone, well, there's a couple of them remaining that are apparently very hard to solve. You can also do this in Jupyter Notebooks. So in this notebook, I have some plugins uh, enabled. This one is JupyterLab Code Formatter. And I copied one of those functions with a very long line. And as you can see, I can also go to apply uh, some formatters. Uh, and that works all very nice. So I would really recommend to install this because it's really useful and it can, with one click, improve the quality of your code. Next thing, I really quickly want to show you how to upload that code to GitHub if you've never done that before. So I'm making a repository here. I'm making a public one and I'm choosing a license. And then it's just a matter of create repository. This is it. Uh, so now there's a repository that contains a license and a readme file. So now I'm cloning the Git repository from the web page to my local computer and I'm copying that file ifs.py that contains the code. You can see it here now. And if I type git status, you can see that there's an untracked file called ifs.py. 
And now I use git add to stage it uh, for commit. And I'm writing a commit message first commit of the IFS script. These commit messages are very useful. If you type them nicely, you get a very nice overview of your project history. Git push then pushes that file to the server. And here you can see it's now added as well. Now let's say I wanted to make a change to this repository. Uh, for example, I noticed that the code quality was not great, so I'm going to apply the yap formatter. Uh, and if you type git status again, you can see that the file has changed. Now I'm going to make, make a new branch using git checkout minus b. The reason to do that is that you don't automatically overwrite the things that are master. So I'm writing the commit message again, apply yap code formatter, and pushing to a new branch. So if you go back to the GitHub repository now, uh, you can see that it recognizes there's a new branch and I'm making a pull request from this branch. And the reason to do that is uh, that in this way you facilitate code review. So this is super useful if you want to have a colleague or uh, somebody else first look at your code before you add it to an existing code base. So let me just show you how we can use this interface. I think this is super nice. I would love to have something similar for reviewing uh, journal publications because you can just go line by line and uh, you can always see changes in the history of the changes. You can also make suggestions. If you're finished reviewing the file, you can approve it or request changes, but in this case, I'm just gonna comment. And now you can see that I reviewed this file and you can do something about that. And if everybody's happy, we can merge the pull request and then it gets added to the master branch, so the default code base. So finally, I want to show an example of a repository that we work on. It's ESM Valto for Earth System Model Validation. And uh, I want to show some of the best practices that we implemented here. So for example, there is a Zenodo file. And then there is also a button which has a DOI in it at the top of the README file. And that will take you to the Zenodo page of this software. So you can actually cite this software in any publication or whatever builds on it. Uh, and that's of course super useful. If we go back to the homepage of the repository, you can see that there's a couple of badges uh, on the top of the README file. And those are actually uh, some quality assurances that you can use for code. You can see that there's a couple of pull requests and if we click on one of them, uh, scroll to the bottom, you can see that there's a couple of automated checks uh, that are being done whenever you commit to this repository. Uh, and those just take a lot of work out of the reviewer's hands. The last thing I want to say about ESM Valtool is that it's a great example of people working together to try and make their code for their system model of validation more uniform. It's always a better idea to join an existing project than to start your own. Now I realize that this can be a lot to take in and not everybody is as passionate about code as I am. So my first advice would be to start small. Just share some code with a colleague and ask for feedback. Maybe as a second advice, you can do some pair programming. So you sit together behind the same computer and just work together on some part of your code. It doesn't matter if your projects are completely different because the next time you can do it the other way around. My third and final advice is to hire a dedicated research software engineer in every research group. And I know that's a big step, but I think not everybody can or wants to do all of this alone. 
and a dedicated research software engineer can help their colleagues uh, implementing these practices and coordinating the uh, research output of your group in terms of software repositories, etc. Um, it is an investment and a big change, but I think it will definitely pay out. That was it. I hope you got inspired. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. And if you want to talk more about this, don't hesitate to get in touch. Cheers.